So I was at TSU in Houston. And um, when my mom and my dad split, uh, my dad, how he got through his divorce, he used to go to the comedy club, which is what he used to do. He's a huge comedy fan. Like, I grew up with comedy in the house. Like, we couldn't really watch certain movies when I was coming up, but when he came to stand up, he just let me watch that. Yeah. And, as, and like, that's kind of like what we bonded over and I kind of got a lot of concept out of life just being around my dad because that's like my mom was around but my dad it was just me and him all the time every day so um, I turned 16 I started working um, and paying shit in the house and helping my dad he treated me different like he treated me like hey man you a man now so we would go out we would go to the comedy club and at the time in Houston the comedy club was just joking Right. Um, so a lot of a lot of big names out of Houston came from there. So it was the only only black comedy club in the city, and the improv wasn't there yet. So really, you know, there was some white comedy clubs, but they didn't book any black acts like that. Right. Um, so that's where all the mainstream black acts would come to. So we go there and go watch comedy and shit. And uh, I knew when I was in high school that I wanted to do stand up, but there was no class. I was a journalism major. I was on track to go and do TV report and news report, but in my head, I didn't want to do that shit every day. I didn't want to talk about the news. You know what I mean? Like, right. I just, I knew what I liked. That's funny, man. Chico said the same exact thing. That's how he got into it. That's I was funny. Going, I was going, I was going to the comedy club, my man. So I knew then that was it. So of course you don't want to just jump out and be like, "Yo, I want to do comedy." Right. You no, know, your parents got the idea for you that going to school and shit. So I was on scholarship. I went to school. Everything was going good. And then when my homeboy, CP, Chris Pierce, this nigga worked in the enrollment office. And uh, he worked in the registrar's office. He was like, man, I got a way I can put put like 20 G's in your pocket. And I was like, all right, what's up? What's the move? He was like, just give me your social. And I got you. I was like, all right. <laughs> I was like, so you telling me, I give you my social. And that's it. And I mean, now mind you, Chris, Chris was the first person I, I ever like got drunk with. Like, right. I ever got drunk. First off, I have been drinking. In Texas, everybody drink. I thought I couldn't get drunk. Right. So he he brought the biggest guy, uh, goddamn thing a gin I'd ever seen. Who was in college? Nigga had the gin with the handle on it. Right, right. Bumpy face. Like, he was like, he's called me rookie. He's like, rookie, you can't you can't drink with me, man. So I'm drinking this goddamn gin. He, we free pouring this shit out into a cup. Oh, fucked up. And that's how we got cool. I went out, cussed out three of my three of my neighbors, pulled my dick out on one of these bitches that was a senior that was uh that was fine. <laughs> and after that, dog, he was like, man, shit, you can hang with us, dog, and him and all his friends. So he told me that shit about the 20 G's. I was like, cool, I gave him my social. He can fuck. Three days later, he, he brought me my, my transcript printed out. That nigga had changed. Six grades. Uh -huh. All my he changed all my C's to B's and all my B's to A's. Uh -huh. Took my GPA from like a 3.2 to a 368. Uh -huh. I ended up getting a scholarship on top of the scholarship I already had right. and some grant money. So they gave me a huge refund check. Walked away with like at the end of it like nineteen thousand dollars. Nineteen with nineteen G's. I was like nigga, I'm lit. It's, it's, it's on. So I'm thinking life is cool. I'm trying to get online for capital. Started going through that process. Everything was good. Nigga, one day they called me and told me, hey man, you uh you need to go to the registrar's office. I just schedule. I was like, cool. I go to the registrar's office and in there it's like 200 people. Like, what the fuck everybody doing in here? Uh -huh. School police department came in. Uh -huh. Then the vice president of the university came in and came in and told us like all y'all are kicked out of school. Y'all to be escorted from school campus, y'all should not come back home, you trespass for academic dishonesty. So, it's like people that's in the band, basketball players, right. like all type of people. So immediately I called Chris, I'm like, Chris, now what the fuck? And nigga didn't answer the phone, he texted me back, he was like, man, I had to run to Louisiana, make that money make sense for yourself. They can't do nothing to you, they can't take you to jail, you ain't do shit. Yeah. All they can do is suspend you, so. I ended up having, he said, request the student hearing and you'll be all right. I requested a student hearing, and in the student hearing, they was like, okay, not gonna expel you, but you're gonna be suspended from school for 
two semesters, right. which is basically a fall and a spring. Right. I was in the middle of the spring, so I had to go through a whole fall and spring, come back in the following fall. So that was the spring of 2003. So I was kicked out the rest of the spring and all of 2004. And that's when I said, fuck it. I ain't got nothing to lose. I got some seed money. I'm going to start going to the comedy club and going on stage. So that's what kind of kept me sane because I've been in school all this time. So I started doing copy. I was going to the comedy club. And nigga, I was, first show I did, had a bunch of money, so I got drunk. Happy hour we had in Houston at this place called Roxy. Ali Sadiq ran it. And Ali, uh, he been on the podcast, but this time, Ali had just got out of jail. He had been in prison for like eight years. And so, uh, he was funny, dog. He just did Comic View. He, he was a younger nigga at the time, and he just started kind of mentoring me. He was like, is this what you really want to do? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, why you want to do this? You think you a fucking clown? You think you a fucking goof? I was like, no, I like really, you know, I used to come and watch y'all niggas when I was just joking and shit. And I think that's what I want to do. And I know in my heart, that's what I want to do. He's like, all right. So he invited me to the, um, to do his room. But the first thing he did was, was like, you know, gave me all these things like, what's your point of view and who are you? And I didn't get none of that. I didn't understand none of that shit. I was just like, I thought it was just to be fucking funny. Right. So I go to the fucking comedy club. I get drunk and fucking drinks. At the time, it was 50 cent. You call it. I mean, 50 cent, you can get a fucking shot of Hennessy. Nigga, I spent about $12 in that bitch. I bought a bunch of drinks for me and like three or four of my friends. Right. Nigga, we was all fucked up. Had what jokes I was gonna say, what I thought was funny. I went on stage, started talking about fucking bitches and eating pussy and shit. It did well. He was mad the whole time though. He was like, nigga, that ain't comedy, nigga. Right. You did, you gotta laugh, but that ain't what comedy about. So. I was like, nigga, you a hater. Right. And so uh, he invited me to his office the next day. At that point, I'm fucking hungover. I get there at like nine in the morning. He say, go out the door and come back in. So I walked out the door and walked back in. And he was like, all right, start your set. And I was like, what? He was like, exactly, nigga. Go out the door and come back in. And basically what he was telling me was, you weren't drunk. You ain't drunk right now. Right. And comedy is about who you are and what you think, you know? And, and from there, I started thinking about comedy. It's different. So uh, I was out of school that whole year, got back in school, and uh, I ended up getting booked by my classmates to do um, the Homecoming Comedy Show. And that was it. I started working this comedy club that was right off campus, right on, like, almost damn near on our school campus, uh, called the Candy Lady. I got a job working there and shit. I ran the open mic night. That's where I started my comedy. That's what well, it's, it's the interesting part about being in a position to be next is always somebody that thought that was gonna be next. Like the next thought is, it's a it's a dangerous place to be in because you can always stay next. The, the, the play with black comics is theoretically most most times it's hard. It's always they want to pit and make you one nigga at a time like. That. Hollywood doesn't know how to ingest all the variations of black men. They only see one type of black person at a time. That's all they know how to ingest, especially with comedy. Because, you know, with comedy, you can sway people's, you can sway people's opinion about how they look at the world. Right. A, a smart, edgy comic can sway your mindset. And you can't have too many niggas running around here changing how people think about shit. Right. Right. It's like, we know how Kevin Hart thinks. It's a safe bet. It's a move. Kevin work his ass off, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I don't take nothing away from Kevin, I don't take nothing away from Mike or Cat, and even our class. So I, I think our class is slightly different is because we play better together. We play way better together than other 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 years did. You know, it was a it was a grind for them. I mean, it was a grind for us, but we play different. Like, shit, we get it. We know it ain't gonna be one thing that's gonna put us over the top. That ain't real life. Like, example, Tiffany Haddish. Tiffany Haddish been doing comedy. She was like 12, 13. And she put in her dirt. And she did show after show after show after show, TV show after TV show after TV show after TV show until it was a point to where Tiffany out talking and she was like, damn, really? She's like, I'm working my ass off and I just, I just 
just got to keep going and trust the system and keep working. You know, sometimes I get in my head and wonder, is this for me? But I know it's for me because I've been doing this and this is what I'm supposed to do. Then she pulls girls trip and it's like, oh my God, Tiffany Haddish, where you been? But she been here the whole fucking time. And so that's just how it is. It's like, you got to keep hitting that motherfucking bag and it ain't a really a next thing. It's like, you got to put your time in and what's for you is for you. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, dog. It, it's going to happen for you. If you do what you're supposed to do, you can, like I can't say this, consistency is a motherfucker. Consistency is probably the hardest thing that keeps most, it's a lot of funny dudes out there funnier than me. But I mean, to me, that's funny. They're not as consistent. Right. And consistency is a, it's a telltale, man. It's like, how well you gonna work then? How you how you gonna work it? Mm, how consistent true. you gonna be? How hard you gonna work? And, and I mean, it don't, it don't cost money to work hard. It don't cost money, like, it ain't got nothing to do with how talented you are. Yeah. I do 